evening, everybody, uh, both those joining us in this meeting online and those watching on the Council's YouTube channel. Uh, we know that there's been huge interest in tonight's discussion, and this is the culmination of a series of policy cabinet discussions that we've been holding in Newcastle over the last year. So often decision making in the Council, at least, is about the day to day. It's about the issues and challenges and the um, business that we need to decide. But one of the innovations that I brought to Newcastle was the concept of a policy cabinet discussion, where instead of taking a decision, we engage with the city, talk about the uh, big issues facing our city and uh, use the expertise across the variety of sectors that we have and the skills and expertise from many people from many organisations to help shape our emerging thinking before we get to the stage of finalising policy. And the intention was always that our policy cabinets would try to make the council more permeable, more accessible, more engaged uh, with our communities. And uh, although throughout lockdown and restrictions, we uh, haven't, uh, we had a couple of years without them, this last year, we've had five policy cabinets uh, around our five major themes. Uh, employment, education and skills, environment, health and social care and housing. And uh, while we haven't been able to do justice to the whole breadth of each of those policy areas, what we have been able to do is focus in on some particular problems and how we can work co to collectively together to solve them. And part of the process that we're going through with these policy discussions is building that collaborative leadership in Newcastle that served us so well throughout the pandemic. And we know that there's been a huge amount of change over the last 18 months, two years. It sometimes feels as though perhaps a decade's worth of normal change has been concertinaed into a relatively short period of time. Changes in how we work, how we commute, how we shop, how we use our leisure time and how we enjoy the uh, natural world around us. We've also uh, been inspired by the holding of COP26 in Glasgow. And uh, as we emerge from the pandemic, we know that many of the inequalities that we've known about for a long time have scarred our communities for a long time have become even more stark. So tonight's discussion is a culmination of all of the policy work we've been doing. And it's what do we need to do next? What do we need to do around creating a city of opportunity for the future? And I'm absolutely delighted that uh, Gordon Brown, uh, who needs absolutely no introduction to everybody here. Gordon, you, 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 you've got a lot of fans in Newcastle, uh, and uh, I know we're all really excited by having you here uh, with us tonight. Um, Gordon's been doing not just thinking around some of these policy issues, but also uh, a, a huge amount of work on the future constitutional challenges that our country faces. And I couldn't think of a better person to ask, and I'm so delighted when he said yes, uh, to uh, help us with this conversation and to help us to position Newcastle in the best place possible uh, to take advantage of the opportunities of the future, but also make sure that we take everybody in our city on the journey with us. So welcome, Gordon, and uh, okay. we've got a, a great online audience for you here tonight. Um, you'll, you'll know that uh, Newcastle is good at cheering crowds it's more difficult to do it online but please do uh, uh, imagine a, a, a warm round of applause for welcome uh, to you tonight and if i can start off with the, the first of the big issues that we need to think about we've set a very ambitious target as a city to reach net zero by 2030 that means thinking deeply about every part of our lives, every part of our activities. With your experience of dealing <clears> with <throat> other cities and nations around the world, what do you think we need to do as Newcastle to create the right conditions to achieve this target? Well, well first of all, Nick, can I say I, I'm delighted uh, to be talking to uh, friends in Newcastle. Uh, Newcastle, I've visited um, every decade since I've been a teenager. Uh, I've been at St. James's Park, I've been at the council buildings, I've been at the university, I've been at many of the shipbuilding yards when they were really thriving. Uh, and so I, I'm really pleased uh, to be able to congratulate you as leader of the council 
and the council itself on what has been great forward-looking thinking. You've just emphasized by your introduction the, the great work that's going into planning for the future. Uh, and I am a fan of local government. Uh, uh, you know, I was once uh, invited to stand for the local council uh, before I became a member of parliament. And I said something like, I don't know if I can do this because I don't understand uh, what was then rate support grant. Uh, and I'm not sure I can do it. And you probably think I didn't understand it when I was the finance minister uh, either. Uh, and uh, and the guy said, look, Paul, if we were going to be stuck, if, if this was a winnable seat, you wouldn't be the candidate. So I was put in my place and I know what a job it's been. I know particularly what a job it's been in the last uh, 12 years when local government expenditure has been cut in real terms. So I've got nothing but praise for all the councillors uh, and the work that you do, Nick. Uh, and I know you're retiring as uh, leader of the council. And I just want to give you a special thanks for the leadership that is known right throughout the United Kingdom and beyond. And this is true of climate change. You know, Newcastle, I do praise you. You were the first city to declare a climate emergency. And I've been in, in uh, London, obviously, talking about climate change, Los Angeles with the mayor, uh, whom I know talking about climate change. And Newcastle always comes up because of the innovative approaches that you've uh, you, you've taken. I like the idea of this civic partnership where you brought in the health authorities and the university. And that's really good. I like your net zero delivery plan. I've read your 2030 action plan and it really is comprehensive. And I suppose uh, your plan that you will cut 79% of your emissions and uh, technology will take you to 100 uh, is really, really bold and really enterprising. As you said, it affects everything, the way we go to work, the way we work, what we produce at work, and of course, the way we live, live, live our lives. And I suppose I'm really excited by the job creation possibilities as well. That Newcastle, you know, has suffered from the loss of uh, so much of shipbuilding and, and the heavy industries. And at the same time, you could be leading the second, if you like, energy revolution. You led the first, you can lead the second. And I like your plans for these clusters. Uh, the offshore wind cluster, which I think is built around Neptune Yard, which I think I've visited before. This national uh, energy system uh, integration center. Now that's really big because that's what we've got to do in every part of the world. And your smart grid lab. Now these are three big, big things. Uh, and in addition to that, you've got more renewables, you've got hydrogen and everything else moving forward. So I do think that Newcastle can turn uh, the challenge of climate change into a huge opportunity for new jobs, good paying jobs, skilled jobs of the future. And Newcastle would be continuing a tradition where you had great skills in shipbuilding and in ship repair. Uh, and now you have great skills in the future. So I think Newcastle can embrace this new opportunity of climate change. Uh, as something that is positive and, and not simply requiring sacrifice. And, and while I was disappointed about COP26, I mean, I do think that COP26 missed the opportunity to deal with the problems in the poorest countries. And I think it missed the opportunity to be more specific about what could be achieved by 2030 and 2050. But of course, we're in a huge progress from where I was when I was at Copenhagen in the COP conference in 2009, where people will be fighting over Europe wanting a target of a 50% cut in carbon emissions, and now, of course, it's 100%. Uh, but what was good about COP26 was not so much the companies or the countries, but the cities all coming together, all making an impact, all trying to do big things. And I think uh, you should be proud of Newcastle. So I would encourage you uh, to show how tackling climate change is a huge job creator for the city and for the surrounding area. Thanks, Gordon. And um, my sense of COP26, and I was there for um, quite a lot of the second week, was that a lot of the focus was on the international arrangements and getting, uh, trying to get agreement from some of the countries that were lagging further behind or less willing to commit. But I felt that was a missed opportunity, as you've just said, for us to be world leading here in the UK. And we know that Newcastle was the place which was at the heart of the original industrial revolution some 200 years ago. You could argue actually that we carbonized the global economy through that, through the use of coal. But it felt to me that the, the, the UK government missed the opportunity really to showcase the excellent work that's going on in, in the UK as a way, not just of consolidating it here in this country, but also of starting to be international in our outlook again. And I, I wonder if maybe you give, give some thoughts on that and also, Given that 
a lot of the work that's going to have to be done is going to be retrofitting work, installation work, kind of practical manual skilled labour. How do we make sure that the jobs that we want to create aren't just an extension of the gig economy? Yeah. Now, we may go on to that when we talk about uh, poverty and what's got to be done in the levelling up strategy. Uh, and that will require local government to have a bigger role, in my, my view, uh, and, and talk about training apprentices, talk about how we can actually increase the skills of the of the area. What, what struck me about the COP26 was on the, the big issues. Uh, Britain could have done a lot more. Uh, and now that it's over and we still said we hadn't solved some of the problems, they're not pushing it, even though they're still the chair of uh, COP. Uh, so when it came to um, the, the strategies for, for dealing with, one, getting uh, to uh, net zero by 2050, um, no chance of doing so with all the announcements that have been made. Uh, and we've really got to find a way of using this chairmanship to push this further. I was disappointed, too, because when we did the recovery in 2009, there was a green element in it, but not big enough. But the recovery plans for 2022 should have a far bigger green element in the government's thinking, working with the European Union, where Franz Timmermans has done a lot to, to create a green element in Europe. And so I was disappointed that we're no longer talking about the Green New Deal coming out of uh, recession and trying to build a stronger uh, re recovery. And of course, it becomes more important to do this Green New Deal now that we see what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and why we must make this transition as early as possible to renewables and not depend on Russian oil, oil and gas. Um, I think companies did le let us down a bit because they, 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 there's a lot of greenwashing going on. They're throwing out uh, targets. They're promising to do this, but there is no uh, supervision or audit of what's, uh, what's going on in a meaningful way. And I feel we should have legal sanction. In other words, there should be a law that requires people to disclose what the real carbon footprint is in certain ways. And we've got to move to impact weighted accounting. So you've got to account not just for profit and loss, but for the social and enviro environmental impact of what you do. And I think uh, Britain could make progress on that as well. So there's a lot of areas whereby you pushing, uh, you local authorities, mayors, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland pushing, I think we can make the British government do more. Uh, and we mustn't allow the... Uh, if you like, the time between this and the next COP to be wasted by not uh, realising that there's a lot of work to do that's still outstanding from COP26. Now, look, when I was at Copenhagen in 2009, a fight broke out. I mean, the Chinese at that time were not even prepared uh, to consider uh, supporting the richer countries having a 50% cut in carbon emissions. And Kevin Rudd, who was the Prime Minister of Australia, was saying, why can't you let uh, countries that are wanting to make this promise uh, do so. And China said, well, we'll be a rich country by 2050 and we won't do it. And they almost ended up in blows uh, because it was such a bitter fight. But that was over 50 percent, as I said. Now we're talking about net zero and we're really in business, but we're going to make it happen. Now, Newcastle can play a part in that. And I think uh, the Green New Deal uh, still has got a lot to uh, commend it. And we should be working on that as we recover with investment from recession. And uh, we know that the net zero ambitions has to be at the heart of our reimagining and reinventing of the economy. But we also know that poverty rates have gone up significantly since 2010. Uh, I was in my early years a as a councillor, uh, chair of one of our Sure Start centres in the city. And I saw firsthand the amazing work that that did, not just with kids from disadvantaged backgrounds, but with their parents, with the wider community, and that universal offer, I think, was a genuine uh, groundbreaker in terms of uh, creating fair opportunities for everybody. But since 2010, poverty rates have gone up. What do we need to be thinking about and refocusing our energies on as a city to make sure that every child has the best possible future ahead of them? Well, look, Nick, Nick what you've done uh, in Newcastle is, is to try to mitigate some of the worst effects of austerity uh, and the particular these cuts in social security benefits that got worse after 2015. I, I, I love your 1001 days project, which is helping the, the very young children get the best of possible starts. I like the fact you've continued uh, to do what Sure Start was uh, trying to do. I also love your educational maintenance allowances for teenagers. You've kept that going when the government uh, uh, scrapped that. You can't replace the child trust fund. You can't. Uh, uh, raise child benefit as it should have been by about 30%. Uh, 
but you have done a lot to try to mitigate the effect of what has happened. But look, I we, we have in my old constituency where I was the MP and I'm still living, we, we, we have a bedding bank now. This, this is what it's come to, that mothers and fathers worried that they cannot turn the heating up in the winter are asking for sheets, for blankets, for pillows, for anything like even sleeping bags, so that the kids can can prevent them, they can prevent the, the kids having to bear the winter cold, particularly at night. And I've got some terrible stories, as you will, about mothers not being able to feed the meters and what the kids are, 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 are facing as a result. We had three kids sleeping under one blanket in one family center in my constituency that we had to, my old constituency we had to deal with. So poverty is now rising at a faster rate. And I look at the figures for the Northeast and see that um, you've gone up so fast since 2015. It was 26%, which was bad enough in 2015. It's now, as I see it, 37%, and that's before COVID. And when I see your figures for free school meals, that you've had to increase the number of free school meals during and after COVID, then we're probably dealing with something near a 40% uh, child poverty. Now, that means that in every class of, uh, of uh, 30, 30, 30 children, Forty uh, percent, and that's uh, what that's uh, six. That's twelve of them are, are actually in 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 poverty, and that's a really big figure, which has got to be dealt with uh, by by various ways. I was urging before we had this start that the local authority leaders, the mayors, and Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland should come together and say on this statement on the twenty third of March, we really have to push the chancellor. He's got to change the. The, the distribution of heating help, it's got to go to the people that cannot afford to pay their heating bills and won't be able to turn up their heating. I think he's going to rescind the £20 cut in universal credit now that we know just what the effect on food, of fuel bills and food bills are, are going to be. And of course, we've got the two-child uh, policy, we've got the cap on uh, uh, council tax, uh, we've got the cap on uh, housing benefit, we've got the cap on benefits as a whole. All these have been measures that are gradually having a huge effect on many families and taking them further into poverty. So we need an anti-poverty strategy. We need what America talked about in the 1960s, a war against uh, poverty. And I was just looking at the figures before I came on. The estimate is that in the three regions of the north of Britain, uh, that young a young child born today will have a life expectancy six years less than in the three more prosperous regions of the South. And we cannot allow this discrepancy and this disparity in life chances to continue. And we can't have a situation where kids are not just missing out of certain things. We all missed out when we were young sometimes and got angry, but actually it was maybe an educational experience. But to be left out permanently, not to be able to enjoy the things that other kids are enjoying, not to be able to have kids visit your home, not to be able to participate in sports activities because you've got to get the kit, not to have the sort of food that you need to give you nutrition. All these things, we cannot allow this to happen. Child poverty is an evil and it's got to be dealt with. And I hope there'll be a campaign right across the local authorities to do something about it. But I do congratulate you on trying to mitigate this. And I know you will step up your activities, given what we now know about what's happening to heating bills and food bills, you'll step up your activities over the next uh, few days to try and change the mind of the Chancellor. It, it sometimes feels to me like fighting poverty is a bit like swimming against the tide because yeah. uh, it's a never ending uh, challenge. But one of the things that I think concerns us all is the uh, significant rise in the number of people living in poverty who are actually in work. The, often, often a conception that people who are poor are people who aren't in work, but we have quite a significant number of people who are now in work, uh, but reliant on in some way or the other on the on the state. And uh, as you said, we've seen the rise certainly in Newcastle of food banks. We've seen amazing generosity by Newcastle United supporters in collecting for those. Uh, we supported them through the pandemic because uh, they were our uh, uh, main distribution point for people who were shielding, who needed uh, food and help. Um, but I mean, you talked just now about a, a bedding bank, uh, and surely it's quite depressing if we've got to the stage where uh, kids don't even have their own bedding and they're having to uh, get it through charitable means. What, well, we, we, what, we, we, what, can, what can we do to kind of make work pay, but pay well, so that people can have security and dignity and Hope for the future. Yeah, we've now got not just food banks, but um, bedding banks. We've got a clothes bank in my old constituency. 
Uh, we've got um, baby banks uh, where people are, are, are giving uh, stuff uh, for, for babies as they're born. Uh, and uh, you're right, two thirds of the people, uh, of the children in poverty are where it's low pay rather than unemployment. And that's a really desperate uh, situation. Now we can raise the minimum wage, we can raise the living wage, and that's really important. But I always argued that we needed tax credits on top of that so that a family with children uh, could find a way of making ends meet uh, based on uh, a rising minimum wage and a rising living wage, but at the same time, you were prepared to make proper provision for children. And when we created tax credits, we were giving about 80 or 90 pounds a week more to, f to families, um, sometimes 100 pounds more, who were, on, uh, who were on low pay. Now, we did not want uh, to encourage employers to pay low pay, and that's why we kept raising the minimum wage, and probably we should have raised it further. But you also need tax credits on top of the uh, minimum wage to keep uh, people in work out of poverty. And of course, it's the erosion of universal credit, which is essentially replacing tax credits. It's the erosion of that and the austerity measures, the two child limit and the limit on benefits as a whole. All these things are actually making it difficult for people to make ends meet. So what do we do? I think we need a, a, a Labour Party will we'll come in with a strategy for dealing with uh, child poverty particularly, but dealing with poverty generally. Uh, we need to have all the initiatives around a, a, an anti-poverty strategy. You've got social workers in schools, you've got summer reading classes, you've got uh, active inclusion service, mental health support. Uh, in our area, we've got a dad's club, a granny's club, all these things to support particularly mothers who are finding it very difficult and fathers uh, to bring up the child with the resources that they need. Uh, and we will have to set out how we can actually share the resources of this country more fairly. Perhaps uh, before 2010, we had a strategy that didn't really, uh, people didn't really understand all the things we were trying to do. And perhaps we failed to get that message across. But I think people are now aware that poverty is a real problem and they are afraid of poverty uh, hitting them. And therefore we've got to actually seize the moment to put across an anti-poverty strategy along the lines I've been talking about. In the early part of the last decade, uh, the government actively tried to uh, talk negatively about people who were supported by the welfare state. You know, there were a lot of talk about benefit scroungers and cheats and, you know, yeah. and so on. Um, do you think the last few years and perhaps the pandemic in particular has start to change public opinion around that and the importance of the welfare state? I think the people people of Britain have changed their views. Uh, I think people um, want a greater fairness and outcome. If you, if you think of what, what people are, are saying, they want equality of opportunity, but they want some fairness and outcome. I mean, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, people were talking about equality of opportunity. I think people now talk about um, equal opportunities for all, unfair privileges for no one. People want more fairness in our society. And I think uh, we can win that argument with people about the need for, for more fairness. I, I do think, however, the present government still works on some of the assumptions uh, of the poor house and the workhouse, that people are lazy, that they're indolent, that they're not to uh, be trusted to work hard and, and, and everything else. And I, I do think that there is still a part of the Conservative Party that feels that. So. I, I do think we have got to continue to explain to people that most of the poverty in this country is where people are working, that most of the poverty is amongst children, that while we've dealt with pension of poverty uh, with bigger measures before 2010, uh, the breaking of the pensioner <laughs> triple lock is going to cause more pension of poverty as well, and it will start to rise. And I think we've got to explain to people that through no fault of their own, these energy bill increases and the food price increases uh, that people would not have expected a few months ago are actually going to savage many people's standards of living and push poverty right into the middle income categories and groups in our society. So I do think this is the right time to say, as a local authority, we're doing what we can. Charity and philanthropy is doing what it can, but you cannot compensate for government cuts at the level of benefits rising only 3% when inflation's at 7 or 8%. Uh, and of course, with that £20 cut, that was clearly something that should never have been done in October, because we are now showing uh, clearly how standards of living have fallen quite far as a result of that. So I think an anti-poverty strategy and a mobilisation around that will get public support. And I'm grateful to Newcastle, because you've been one of the leaders. You brought all the different organisations concerned with poverty together. And I think that's a really important way of integrating the response to poverty, because it's not just about financial support. It's also about services in support as well. And, and part of what we set out to do when the government starts to make the 
holes in the welfare state and the safety net bigger was to try to find ways in which we could plug some of them ourselves as a city and as you say we haven't been able to plug all of those holes but we have helped quite a significant number of people and you talked about fairness and a greater sense of fairness and the government perhaps have recognized that with the leveling up agenda that they've announced with the, the number of missions uh, and uh, uh, certainly an intent which i think we would probably both uh, agree with so what, what do you make of their leveling up uh, agenda do you think they've got it right and 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 particularly because we're talking about newcastle here yeah you know, how, how can newcastle position best out of uh, this yeah. to take advantage of it well, you know, if the levelling up strategy was 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 really serious about getting things done, there would have been a child poverty and family poverty target, and they wouldn't have abandoned the target that we'd set to abolish child poverty uh, over the lifetime uh, of our of our of our, uh, of our government and by 2020 if we'd succeeded in getting there. Uh, and so there's no child poverty target. There's no poverty target. There are other targets which are interesting targets, but there's not the money, and there is not the implementation strategy that would require you, Newcastle, to have more powers to deliver on it. So, so what we've got is a statement of uh, objectives. Um, and of course, when it comes down to it, I could say I'm levelling up. If you move from the bottom rung of the ladder to the second, second bottom rung, that's levelling up. It's small levelling up. But what people really want is equality of opportunity and some fairness in outcome. And that's what we should be trying to achieve. Now, I, I actually got a quote. The person who actually was the architect of the levelling up strategy he said this because it had to start with economic growth and economic uh, development and uh, the creation of good jobs and high paying jobs. And it really comes back to transforming the opportunities for regional productivity growth and giving you the tools by which you can increase the productivity of your industries and get pay people good wages and at the same time invest heavily in, in the future in education and everything else. But what she said was too many people seem to equate levelling up with transforming regional productivity, affecting every town in provincial England and Wales within a parliament. Obviously, if that's what voters wanted, they would be disappointed. So, so what they're really saying is uh, that if you think that the gap between the north and the south in terms of productivity levels and growth levels and investment and employment uh, levels and wage levels as a result of that is going to be narrowed, Forget it. Uh, and what they are engaged in is something more cosmetic, I think, in the short term, which will be small budgets there, competition between different local authorities, which is ridiculous because it should be based on need. And I think what Newcastle should, should, should be saying is you are prepared to do the levelling up, but you need the resources and you need the powers to do it. And I think that's what's missing in the levelling up strategy resources. Remember, East Germany was leveled up in a sense to West Germany, but it took 4% of national income to be transferred from West Germany to East Germany every year for 20 years. Now they are not, and that's trillions of, uh, of euros, you might say trillions of pounds involved. That's not what they're saying. It's small amounts of money competed with uh, between different local authorities, uh, a little coming here and there and everywhere else. That is not the kind of transformation uh, that people should expect when you're talking about narrowing the gap and equalizing the possibilities and opportunities between the north and the south. So uh, I, I think uh, you and the other local authorities have got to press for A, the resources and B, and I think we'll come on to this, the powers that you need to be able to deliver. You need powers in training and skills. You need powers in planning uh, and transport, which are still held at central government level. And you need powers even to deliver research and development uh, support for your local industries. Now, these are things that could be done, but they're not really in the white paper on levelling up. And one of the things that struck me looking at not just the, the white paper, but my own experience uh, as a leader uh, in a big city is that it's possible to both have economic growth and increase GDP and increase inequalities at the same time. Yes. Uh, and you, you have to have an, an approach which takes people with you on that journey so that people don't feel exploited, ripped off, left behind, uh, because that's when you start to see the decay of society. That's when you start to see uh, tension between communities. That's when you start to see the fertile ground for the far right. Uh, to, to take root, because if people feel aggrieved, they start to look for somebody to blame. And uh, often that can be about who they perceive has caused their economic uh, misfortune. Uh, so 
I know that the government, this government, talks about the levelling up agenda as basically kind of departmental approach. Um, but in your experience of government, what, what should they be doing to make sure that it's consistent and across the board? Well, you've got to coordinate in a way that I don't think this government is doing. Uh, and you've got to bring people together. See, I would have a council of the regions and nations that would involve local authorities, regional leaders, uh, and the governments of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Australia, during COVID, recognised that the cabinet was insufficient uh, to bring people together and to coordinate. So they created a regional cabinet with all their provinces and all their uh, different uh, uh, mun municipalities. And they're continuing that now because they realise uh, that they need to bring all the different parts of the country together to discuss these things. But as you know, local authorities are not brought into the discussion or are the mayors in, in that. In, I, I'm getting that rebound. Is that right? I, I'm saying local authorities and the mayors and the um, uh, all the combined authorities are not really brought into this discussion at the level that's necessary. See, the prime minister should chair it. And we created regional ministers, as you know, and I still think that was a good idea. But but all the different authorities that are making big decisions should be brought into the decision making sphere when it's leveling up, when it's dealing with COVID and when there are major issues like that. And, and it should be uh, the same sort of uh, status as the cabinet, because these are big decisions that you can only make properly if you consult with the people who are really going to have to bear the brunt of these decisions, and that's people in all the communities of the country. So you do need a different structure of decision making in this country. And I think we, we have realised, because I'm chairing the Labour Party's Commission on the Future of the UK, we've realised that uh, we have inequality that is some of the worst in, in Europe. The division between the rich and the poor regions is some of the worst in Europe, even including Eastern Europe. Uh, for example, 50% of digital economy jobs are in London and the South East. 40% of financial services jobs are in London. 60% of R&D jobs are in the Golden Triangle. So, so we're, 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 we're not uh, bringing people into all aspects of economic development, but you've got this inequality. But centralization has actually worsened the inequality, and we have, as a result, an unbalanced economy. And, and so we have forced emigration from some parts of the countries, high levels of unemployment, low wages, poor... Uh, services and in other parts of the country we've got overheating we've got inflationary uh, house prices we've got uh, congestion and, and things that actually lead to inflation uh, in over the whole economy so we've got an unbalanced economy so it's not just in the interest of the north to get things done it's in the interest of the whole of the country to have a more balanced economy, economy. and that's what the government doesn't seem to understand as they proceed with this leveling up strategy Certainly, I've chaired core cities for the last three years, and we know that if the core cities in the UK just performed at the national average rather than below the national average, I think there's only one of the core cities which performs above the national average, and I think that's Bristol, then we can add the value of the economy of Sweden to the UK economy. That's a huge prize. Exactly. But, but, but the, that, that inequality of power between central and local government uh, was, for me, never... Uh, um, hugely apparent right the way throughout COVID uh, because we were all having to find our way. It was a very uncertain time for everybody uh, and there was very much a sense that we were uh, left in the dark and uh, not kept in the loop of decision making and our experience of what was happening on the ground wasn't used in any way by central government. Uh, and that feels to be a real weakness. We're one of the most centralised countries, uh, certainly in Western Europe, possibly in the world. And you've been doing a huge amount of thinking around constitutional arrangements, what they might be uh, need to be in, in terms of being fit for purpose for the future. So it'd be really good to get your thoughts on what we need to be doing to ensure we've got good local leadership and institutions that build trust and promote democratic values that aren't simply run from behind desks in Whitehall and Westminster. That's right. We've got to give local government more freedoms. There's no doubt about it, and I'm convinced of that case. And if you actually look at uh, what's happened over the last few years, uh, the numbers of employees in central government have gone up from 2.7 million to 3.4 million. The numbers of employees in local government have gone down from 2.7 million to 2 million. So there's been a sea change since 2010. But of course, we didn't uh, satisfactorily solve the problem of local government finance either. And there's a lot of lessons that we've got to learn. In other countries, 
perhaps 60% 60 of expenditure is done by local government. If you look at the average across uh, Europe and everywhere else, in Britain, it's about 35%. And of course, you're not given the freedom to, to raise taxes in the way that in other countries, local governments uh, can get sales taxes and everything else. So we've got to look at look at, look at at that, that as well. I, I think we've got to lay down a duty of cooperation. So first of all, central government has a duty to cooperate. So during the, um, the, the COVID, you could have taken the government to court for not cooperating with you and not consulting properly with you. I think we need to lay down also a, a rule about equality of conditions. That our aim is equality of conditions, and we've got to do something about it. And again, it should be justiciable that if things are not happening, uh, you should be able to take the government to court. Now, when the South Africans uh, had their new constitution, they gave people a right, for example, to housing, and people were taking the South African government to court because of its failure to deliver on that. And it should be something that British governments have got to face up to as well. Then I would say, uh, we need to deal with, uh, first first of all, the budgeting over a longer period of time to give you more freedom to, to make your expenditure decisions to last instead of year to year. I think we need more flexibility in the way that government gives uh, money to local authorities. I think that's very important. I, I think that uh, different authorities need different borrowing powers as well, and that's something that uh, that should be should be considered as well, because you have big projects as well, and it's uh, it's a possibility that you could actually uh, borrow to deliver on these uh, in a way that you're not able to do at the moment. And I think as far as the economy is concerned, I mentioned these three areas, training and skills, planning, uh, housing and uh, transport, uh, and also research, development and innovation. I think in these areas, the right powers have got to be in the right places. And it's clear to me the right powers are not in the right places at the moment, that there's too much centralization on the education and skills side. And even this new government bill on, on an education about chambers of commerce, it doesn't really make sense to me that local authorities are not properly involved here. And then when it comes to transport, housing, planning and so on, the, I think you need a bit more freedom and equally at the same time. I would like to see you being centres of local initiative. And that means you've got to have some powers uh, on innovation and research and funding, funding these things. So these are the sort of areas I would talk about. But they mean that you would be able to create more good jobs. They mean that you would be able to do something about uh, workplace poverty. Uh, and they mean, of course, that you'd be, you'd be able to have a cleaner environment uh, at your discretion and your decision making process. And do, do you think we've seen the emergence of mayoral combined authorities, uh, mayors uh, in various places around the country? Do you think that's the right solution or do you think we should be looking at uh, more regional government? I think I think. Uh, we, we, we've we got this situation where after 2010, and in fact, we created the, the legislation in 2009 to make it uh, possible uh, that as areas decide to move forward, they do so at their own speed. And, and I think the United Kingdom will always be asymmetrical in the sense you've got Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and you've got, uh, you've got England. And of course, England's 85% of the country. You've got then uh, regions, local government areas and communities in England and I think uh, rather than the centre telling everybody you've got to do it this way or that way, I, I think you've got to rely on people coming together at a local level to make some of the decisions. So what's suitable for uh, the Tyne may not be suitable for the Tees, actually, but what's suitable for uh, Newcastle may not be suitable for Manchester. So I, I think you've got to have the, a great deal of freedom to bring forward your own proposals. But our general idea must be, the principle must be, to devolve as much as possible so that decisions are made as close to home as possible and at the discretion and the decision of local people making these decisions. Because what we found in this commission, and I probably should have said that at the beginning of this uh, part of the discussion, is that people, you know, Britain we found is far more economically progressive than, than the government reflects. Uh, people are far more socially egalitarian. It's why Gareth Southgate struck a, a huge chord last summer when he talked about uh, uh, an inclusive society, diverse uh, racial equality. Uh, we, we may be uh, more um, culturally mainstream, perhaps, uh, than some people want us want, want us to be. Uh, there's a pride in our history and our, in, our, in, in, in our traditions and culture. But what came out of what we've been looking at is people have a far stronger sense of the local communities and the local loyalties and the local identities than before. So if you look at the sur surveys for, for Newcastle, I'm sure it says, if I remember right, that people feel equally Geordies are, are, are proud of Newcastle, proud of England, proud of Britain. 
uh, and local loyalties are far stronger now in the way people uh, talk about uh, the importance they attach to that. And you'll be pleased to know that uh, local authority leaders are more popular than members of parliament in the surveys that we've done. Uh, and, uh, and 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 it, it does reflect the fact that people have seen in this crisis that local authorities and local leaders have played a very important role. And I do think that you've got to build the future constitution around this sense that what happens locally is the building block of what we do. Uh, and the more power we can devolve and the more power that can be held by local communities uh, and, and the more they can exercise that power with the resources to do so. Because remember, you can give people powers, but they don't have the resources. You've got to have the resources to do so. So let's talk about the right powers in the right places. And I think we'll find that uh, Newcastle uh, and uh, other local authorities will need more powers to do the things we've just been talking about in climate change and research innovation and also dealing with uh, uh, child poverty and other and, and other really important cost of living issues that that, fa that face people. Uh, I, I can't say I pretend to be popular in my own ward, but there we are. That's that's history now. Um, and, but I, I do think people know that you've done a great job for for Newcastle and are very proud of what Newcastle has achieved. And and you know I think uh, there's so much to build from uh, in the po anti poverty initiatives, the environmental initiatives. The jobs initiatives that you 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 you, you and your council have taken, and, and I do think this pride in local communities is greater now than it was, and we really have to build from that. And if you build a constitution around the centre, Whitehall, Westminster, you're not really talking about how people see their lives. People want to feel that they've got more control over their lives, and one of the ways that that happens is is when uh, local communities can exercise more power through the local authorities or community councils or, or the institutions that they choose to create. Gordon, can I bring in Lisa Goodwin? Because she's got a question which I think absolutely follows this, this theme a bit further. And well, you know, we, we complain in Newcastle about a centralised country, but actually people also complain in the city about a centralised city. Uh, Lisa. Thank you, Nick. Um, hi, Gordon. Hi, Lisa. Hi. So I think you're actually you're, you've touched a little bit on the, on the answer to my question already when you said the right powers in the right places. But my question was related to um, community empowerment in general. And we saw during the pandemic how much local communities are able to achieve when they're just allowed to get on with it. And the question to you really was, in your view, what's the role of central government in supporting and enabling that empowerment of local places and local communities? Um, I think we're sort of we're agreeing that levelling up probably isn't doing that and isn't doing what we need. But what is the role and how do we how do how do we get central government to, to step back? Yeah, I, I've been involved in not only looking at but trying to support a number of uh, community uh, initiatives. Uh, and that there is quite a lot of work being done on community power um, and trying to enable uh, communities, individuals coming together in groups to take power over certain areas of their lives. And I think this is a growing movement that that, that no doubt is strong in Newcastle, but is also strong in other parts of, of England. And I know there's some councils in Scotland that I've been uh, following uh, that are also trying to empower people and create cooperatives and, and other ways of, of running institutions. So what's the role of central government in this, you ask? Well, I think you've got to provide uh, the funds to encourage this. So I think I think you should be an enabling uh, government and enable people uh, to take over control of certain things if that is what they want to do. Uh, I, and I say there's got to be a duty of cooperation uh, in future and there's got to be a, a requirement for equality of living conditions. But I would say that local authorities also can support community groups as they try to do more themselves in their, in their, in their own areas. I mean, you know, I was talking earlier about the problem of child poverty. And what I've found is that a local family center, which, which I'm in, involved in and have been for a long time, is actually more capable of doing some of the things that we have been trying to do, uh, sometimes as central government, sometimes as local authorities, but has brought different charities together, brought different groups together, and we should enable that family center to do more and we should give it the resources to do so. So we're talking not just about uh, central government empowering local government. We're talking about local government in a position to empower local communities uh, with more, uh, not just consultation, but participation. But I come back to the central question, perhaps because of being a finance minister. You know, they say about finance ministers, uh, chancellors, that there's only two kinds, those who fail and those who get out just in time. 
and uh, nobody's going to praise a chancellor when they when they finish their work uh, because there's always a crisis that they're going to be blamed for uh, but it does come back to resources and and i think uh, if you're going to encourage community activism and you're going to empower people to take uh, some more control over particular institutions you've got to set aside the funds to make that possible the funds to encourage people to do the, the work, to plan for these things, to encourage people when they start off doing these things, and of course, to keep these uh, keep these things going. And I, I do come back to this. It was our failure as well. We did not release enough um, uh, power of uh, ra raising revenue and using revenue to, to local authorities in the time that we were in, in, in government. Uh, and we really have to consider uh, that local authorities in the last few years have been leading the way in trying to do new things and deserve to have the funds uh, to do so. And Lisa uh, works in the voluntary sector and we've always had a good relationship with the voluntary sector. It absolutely came into its own throughout the pandemic because uh, suddenly there was a, a resource there that was able to reach people that we couldn't reach. Uh, they were able to be nimble and flexible in setting up new services. And I, I genuinely feel that the relationship with the voluntary sector got much more strong and much more equal uh, throughout COVID. And uh, it was a really good example of how community empowerment, community engagement and uh, community support and capacity and infrastructure is so important for modern life. So, so, you, we, so you've got to look at, Nick, where where are the, the sources of initiative in your local area? And it sometimes will come from councillors, it sometimes will come from MPs, but it will often come from local organisations uh, deciding that something is wrong and wanting to do something about it. The innovations I've seen in my own constituency have come in the main from local organizations, community groups, family centers, deciding to do things differently. But there is this problem. I worked out that our county, Fife, uh, with more than 30,000 people in, in, in poverty, lost 36 million the time that the 20 pounds a week was cut in October. And you will have the same sort of figures for Newcastle. I've also worked out that by the time we're finished with the fuel bill rises and 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 the and the, the the real terms rise in benefit being inadequate, given the inflation that people are facing, people are going to be um, short not just of 30 million in Fife, but of about 60 million in Fife, and that's m m my county. Now I've also worked out that we can actually do a lot more in charity and philanthropy, and people like in Newcastle, uh, like at the football ground, are very generous in giving money. But I reckon with all the projects we're doing, and we've got a very innovative one at the moment, uh, uh, getting uh, goods that are, that, are, that, that, are, that are not being used and a surplus from companies to give to people. But we could raise about 6 million this year. So we lose 60 million and we raise 6 million. And so the resourcing question becomes really important because we can't ask charities and voluntary organizations to do things that they cannot do. They cannot replace the safety net of the welfare state. They can minimize the damage and they can ameliorate some of the, the problems. But the resource issue, uh, I know from being chancellor, is, is really important. And so if you're trying to tackle child poverty, for example, you can't do it simply by philanthropy. You do need resources. And that's why we've got an all campaign throughout the United Kingdom to change the position of the government. One of the things that I've, the, the tightrope, I guess, I've walked virtually every day that I've been a leader is, um, on the one hand, acknowledging and um, uh, giving validity to the real inequalities, the real poverty issues in my communities. But on the other hand, not wanting our city to be just de defined by that view of poverty and to have a forward looking view of the future and be bold and ambitious about having a better future ahead of it. Because if we don't have that confidence, then um, who else will? And we have to, I think, understand and own our inequalities in order to spur us on to do more to overcome them. And we're clearly moving. Uh, the economy is changing. It's it's all the time we're moving more and more towards uh, a kind of knowledge led economy. And uh, that can, in one way takes us forward, but also takes us back to 250 years ago when Newcastle was the kind of place where things weren't just invented. They were invented and made. Can I bring in Chris Day, from uh, who's the Vice Chancellor of Newcastle University, to perhaps develop this theme, Chris? Chris, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Hi, Gordon. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm good a, evening, Chris. I, I'm leading a piece for Universities UK as well on the overall role of universities in the economic recovery post COVID. And I think just saying that in places like Newcastle, what they can do as anchor institutions, working with the public sector, like the council and the commercial sector, bringing them together in where you've got that uh, coalition of, of, of university strengths, classically thought of as knowledge exchange and R and D, but but also in producing the skills, I think that become just more and more important for institutions like ours, where working with companies that are coming into the area are already here and saying, what kind of graduates do you want? And I, I think we're finding those links between universities and the commercial sector even stronger than the classical R and D knowledge transfer, you know, because that's so important for, the, for that economic growth, don't you think? Well, I, I uh, like Newcastle University. I've always enjoyed visiting the university. I, you may know, Chris, I was once a university uh, uh, lecturer, and I always said that universities stand for objectivity, impartiality, rationality, the pursuit of truth, the search for knowledge. And these were all the qualities I had to leave behind when I went into politics. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I welcome the, the engagement of the universities now in local economies, because yes, universities have got a global role and you're global institutions, but equally, uh, the work you do to link up uh, university business uh, and the the, uh, the community as a whole is really important to the future of the local economy. Technology transfer, uh, the way that innovation can yield uh, jobs. I mean, we've got a very good example in Scotland of a university that not many people have heard of, Abate University, yeah. which is, has become the, the university for the video games industry. And so Dundee, which is the university town, has now been, you know, several thousand jobs have been created as a result of being part of this video games and Minecraft and all these things have come out of Dundee. So so universities uh, can play a huge part and you will have better examples than me from what Newcastle has, uh, has done. But I know you're at the center of the climate change uh, revolution and I know that you can work with local firms to make them great um, success stories. One of the things that has worried me when looking at the future of the United Kingdom for, for Kia is when I look at local training, um, in some cases, uh, because these schemes are basically chosen nationally and the local uh, authorities are not in a position to say, look, this is what we need locally for skills. Yeah. You tend to get the cheaper courses being encouraged because you get the money for them and putting people through courses that are not necessarily the courses that are gonna get them the jobs or certainly the good jobs yeah. to the neglect of some of the courses that colleges could do if the local authorities and business were working together and saying, look, let's us decide what the courses we're gonna give priority to in our local area. I don't think there's enough of that. So uh, universities and colleges, I think have a really important part to play in, play in the future. And I, for one, want to see far more devolution of responsibility for training and skills, but I also want to see some budget for innovation where the money for R&D does not go to this golden triangle only uh, of course, we've got to support the, the, the these these high level uh, research projects, but there are high level research projects in Newcastle, Edinburgh, Strathclyde, in in Manchester, and so on. Uh, and and you need to get some more of the uh, of the money. Uh, and the I think it's called uh, in the In Places Fund or Strength in Places Strength Fund. Places, yeah. Yeah, I think we could do more with that. It could be more long term. It could be more directed to to helping uh, uh, the different parts of the country, and it could be more controlled locally. I think. Uh, to give a, a greater say uh, for local authority leaders like like Nick and and for university leaders like yourself in in setting what the priorities you have locally, and making the resources uh, fund them as far as possible. So I think more local control, but equally more local uh, collaboration between the different institutions. Nick, can I just come back on that for a second with a follow up comment? So two two very quick things. First of all, I think you'd be delighted about the new culture of universities working with FE colleges and yeah. schools to produce that whole pipeline of skills at different skill levels that clearly innovative companies want. They want those straight out of school, but they also want PhDs. And the way to do that is to work together. And that's what you'll, you'll see a lot of that in the Northeast. I think I've worked in various UKRI MRC organizations over the years. And in your second point about sort of regional R&D spend, and you'll know that you always come up against the sort of excellence argument, oh, well, you should just fund on excellence. And the trouble is it always ends up in the same place. I think what I've argued is that above a certain quality bar with, say, you know, the classical grant applications, then the, the decisions made by those awarding bodies shouldn't just go on, you know, which is the 10 out of 10 grant. As long as it's above a sort of 
seven out of ten grant score you should also be asking in your box ticking you know um, what will be the impact on the local economy what will be the impact locally and taking that into account as much as the is this likely to lead to the best paid publications in the best journals and i'm not i don't understand why that's never taken any traction because it seems to me to be such an obvious thing to add that to the sort of quality rating of a, of a classical application well, you, you've now got um, Andrew McKenzie, who's chairman of the UK RI. Yes. yes. And, and, and he's, uh, you know, uh, from BHP Billiton and now Shell. He's yeah. got a very good idea of not only um, the needs of the economy for the future, but also he's got a very good understanding of the regions and nations of Britain. So yeah. I, I do I do hope you'll be able to build up a working relationship with the UK RI that gives uh, more uh, accent uh, to what's happening in the, the different parts of the country that, than, than just the Golden Triangle. And I'm sure... Uh, that if the levelling up strategy is pursued, and this is one part of the levelling up strategy, uh, then uh, you've got a big claim on resources, uh, whether it's the Strength in Places Fund or whether it's through new funds uh, that you're going to be involved in that I think you've mentioned in some of your submissions. Yeah, thanks. Oh, and we're not going to do this without harnessing the energy and enthusiasm of the private sector. So can I have a quick question from Lucy Winskill, Lucy? Thank you. Um, good evening, both. Can I just pick up the theme, first of all, about the universities and FE working together? And, and Chris was very good to reference the universities in Newcastle. Gordon, we've got two amazing universities here. So come and visit <laughs> both when you next revisit. Nick, Absolutely. Nick, I have my tongue firmly in, in my cheek there. My question is around the, the voice of business. Um, and in the, government, the government's levelling up white paper and the review of LEPs, the government's confirmed the strength and value of business-led local enterprise partnerships. And I chair the, the North East LEP. We're very keen to play our part in the devolution discussion and see greater devolution. So we're all on the same page around the right, um, the right powers and the right places. My question to you is how does a local authority like Newcastle best harness that business voice in not just policy making but delivery as well, the two going cap in hand? Thank you. Well, it's first of all by consultation and listening. And I, I know Nick has put great emphasis on that. And and we certainly tried in government to be a listening government when it came to the needs of business. And we wanted that to happen at a regional and local level as well. And perhaps we weren't as successful as we should have been with the, the regional development agencies and our attempt with regional ministers to have a better sounding board for business when it came to uh, local local and regional economies. Uh, I mean, my, my own experience is that when you get people together and you actually can bring people to a discussion on specifics related to the future of the local economy, people in every business that I've come across uh, in my local area are desperate to be part of that discussion and want to be part of it. So I think it's uh, calling people together. I mean, wh where I was worried about the, the, the new training and skills initiative was it seemed to exclude local authorities and, and put uh, perhaps too much emphasis on chambers of commerce, which don't really have the the, the budgets to be able to do this. Uh, and I do think, uh, I don't know if it's going to be changed this, but the amendments uh, uh, were, were, were really too exclusive of local authorities. So I would like to see local authorities more involved in the training and skills process, not at the exclusion of chambers of commerce, but uh, but, but working together. Uh, and, and, and again, it comes back to this. I mean, if you've got a local partnership, it's really got to have a budget as well. It's got to be able to, you know, to, 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 to take, it, take innovative steps where possible. And I think you have to come back to the financing of these things, uh, things also. But start with consultation. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes we as a government made a mistake by not consulting people early enough, by not listening when we could have, by not sort of hearing uh, what 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 you've mentioned the voice of business uh, quickly enough and I think uh, we've le we've learned that lesson as as a Labour Party and I hope that uh, we can see increased consultation when it comes to the recovery uh, 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 and and w whether that's uh, going to be easy given everything that's happening in Ukraine uh, we really have to try and work for a greener recovery and also a good jobs led recovery uh, and that requires us to concentrate on what you're talking about more, better skills and better training. Gordon, we, we, we could easily have another hour talking about these really interesting topics. But the whole purpose of tonight was to 
flush out some of the really big issues that we need to be focusing on as a city over the next few years as we emerge from COVID, as we restructure the economy around uh, our net zero commitments. And uh, the, the, many of the people on this call tonight are members of our City Futures Board. Uh, the City Futures Board isn't just our economic recovery board, it's also our health and well-being board and it's also yeah. played the role of our covid control board throughout the pandemic uh, and we've deliberately done that because we didn't want the economic conversation to be separate from the social uh, uh conversation around inequalities and uh i wanted everybody to see that both growing the economy and doing it with a sense of fairness that took people with us was everybody's business not just and there could sometimes be a bit of a sense that we leave the jobs and the economy to the private sector and we leave the, the social problems to the uh, public and voluntary sector and I didn't want that in, in Newcastle so one of the things I'm really proud of here is the strong sense of partnership and collaboration that we have across agencies across organizations and the relationships that exist in the city that mean that uh, I think we've got a huge, huge capacity to take advantage of the future. Can, can I can I leave you maybe with a story that uh, brings together your theme, which is that economic growth and social justice can go together. And I think throughout our conversation, we've been uh, trying to show a good jobs, create uh, better opportunities, finance public services, and at the same time reduce poverty. And now J.K. Galbraith, the the the, the economist, uh, was was uh, someone I knew, uh, and luckily uh, I, I managed to meet him. And he wrote, of course, about the Great Depression, and he wrote about uh, economic policy. But he was invited to to Vienna to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Austrian Republics in 1945 to 1985, being created. And there was this group of economists uh, in the front row to greet him because Austria had these great famous neoliberal economies, Professor Hayek. Monvises and I think other names like Hilbronner and so on, and they were sitting in the front row. And, and J.K. Galbraith told me that he started his lecture saying he wanted to congratulate uh, the Austrian uh, Republic on 40 years uh, when it managed to combine economic growth and social justice and had a great record for both. And he wanted to particularly thank Professor von Hayek and his friends uh, for what they had contributed towards this, because if they had not left Austria in 1945, Austria could never have enjoyed the combination of economic growth and social justice. So here he was. I mean, it's a, a criticizing neoliberalism, but I think what's happened, and I think this is more mainstream now across the political parties, is that we see the connection between economic growth and social justice, and we need we need to move both forward together. And so we all advance if we advance uh, together and growth and progress is not one group at the expense of the other, we must find a way of including everybody uh, working together. And I think that's what you've been trying to do in Newcastle. And I'm very uh, praiseworthy of what you've uh, achieved over these years. But I think that's the, the message for the future. And it's not just economic growth and social justice, of course, it's environmental sustainability as well. That is really the trinity of objectives that we need to pursue both at a local and national and indeed at an international level. So I apologize for the story if it was uh, too political, but uh, but uh, J.K. Galbraith did make a point about the importance of economic growth and social justice going hand in hand and in harmony together. Uh, as somebody who had to write essays about Hayek at university, uh, I fully understood it and uh, got the joke. So, um, Gordon, you've been inspirational tonight. It's been a fascinating conversation and I know you've given us a huge amount of food for thought. And I just want to say on behalf of Newcastle, a massive thank you for taking the time to spend this evening with us. It's, we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll make sure, the people on this call will make sure that uh, we pick up the threads of this as we move forward. And uh, you, you, you've, uh, you've given us a huge amount to think about, but you've also helped us to understand that actually we've got something special here in the city, something really good. Uh, we've worked really hard to create that and uh, that kind of spirit of optimism uh, and opportunity for the future, I think, is one that will uh, certainly live on past all of us. So, Gordon, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, let's give Gordon a big round of applause, everybody. And, and to you, uh, Nick, for chairing it, and to all the questioners, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good evening.